Yeah. Yeah. So in some sense, one could also say that the sin has been forgiven. And they should be joyful with that, not because of the sin has been forgiven. Right, yeah. It's a similar idea. Okay. Thank you. I'm gonna check a text quickly. So for prayer request this morning, um, Elaine Ross is going to be starting radiation treatments um, in the coming weeks. It's going to be five days a week for six weeks. Um, if, it, if anyone would be able to give her a ride occasionally, if we can set something up like that, that, that would be pretty helpful, I think. Otherwise, she's planning on taking the, the beta bus, but I, I think we can help her out better than that. I don't know what time. What was Okay. It's five days a week. Okay, well, we'll see if we can find some, some folks to help you out. Okay. Thank you. Two false. Yeah. Other prayer requests. Uh, for Uncle Jeremy, the, for health and spiritual. Mm -hmm. Also, pray for those who are continually uh, injured by hurt by the Lord, and for those pastors who are preaching uh, hostile countries and systems. Other prayer requests. Nice day, absolutely. Right, uh, Rhonda texted me about that. Yeah. Do we know any details? Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Spencer. Other prayer requests. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you both give and take away according to your good and gracious will for us. Comfort the family of Spencer Murphy as they mourn. Grant that they would not despair in this life, but that they would rejoice in the salvation won by Christ and him crucified, and let them continue to be pro provided for in this life. Thank you for, for the good weather today. Um, thank you for giving Elaine Ross a diagnosis. Uh, please bless her in her treatment and recovery, grant her strength, grant her healing, and let this um, ongoing time of suffering serve to draw her closer to you, and let us help her out. Have mercy on Jeremy. Please bless him in his health as well as in his soul, that he would know you and your salvation. Um, bless those who, who continually have to suffer with war and its effects. Um, let them not become war-weary in, in such a way that it draws them away from you, but let them flee to you and cling to you. 
and bless also pastors that are in hostile countries and systems. Grant that they will continue to preach your word for the good and for the salvation of your people. We ask this for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so we are up to the service of the sacrament. So we'll be looking kind of both at divine service setting one and three. So if you have both um, page 194 and 160, 194 and 160, 194 and 160. Setting one has some prayers that um, setting three doesn't. <clears throat> so this um, this is after the conclusion of the service of the word, uh, which includes with the offertory, including the, the prayers, where, where, we, where we render our sacrifices of thanks and praise to God, um, as well as our offerings from the income which the Lord gives us. And we pray for, for those who are in need. And then we turn from, from, what is, um, from what the Lord gives for the sake of all people. And we turn to what he gives for the sake of particularly the, the mature Christians, those who have been uh, baptized, those who have learned the faith and believe, um, and believe the faith. Um, and that is the service of the sacrament. While others are, while outsiders are still present these days for for the service of the sacrament, um, we ask that they either um, don't come up or or that we'll just give them a blessing if they do, sort of a thing. Um, because the sacrament at our altar is meant for our people gathered here together as the body of Christ, and especially for those that believe the same thing and, and especially believe what they're receiving here in this sacrament. Back in the day, back in the early church, um, especially when Christianity was illegal, they would kick out the people who were just catechumens, those who had not yet um, fully learned the faith. Um, so so for those adult converts who were still studying, they would they would be removed from, from the sanctuary. This would be the time where they would be dismissed. And they would. Uh, we have we have records. Um, I forget which ones exactly, but 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 of the crying out the doors, the doors. That is, lock the doors. Right. This is for us. Um, and so it gives this great unity for those who are brought together in that way. Especially when it, it could get you killed. Being a Christian could get you killed in certain times and places, and and the early church was among those. Right. And so for those who had learn and confess the faith altogether, they had, been, they had been brought into full fellowship, well, then they celebrate that fellowship in the communion of saints there in the Lord's Supper. So the service of the word, the first part of the divine service, is meant for all people. It's the proclamation of law and gospel for the sake of all people. Here, in the service of the sacraments, we get the law, but especially the gospel, for the sake of those Christians um, who are gathered here and who are well prepared to receive it. Okay, so it goes from a general thing to, to a more specific thing. Okay. Um, page 194, we'll, use, we'll keep using service uh, setting three as our main outline here. The Lord be with y'all. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is right. So this is the old, oldest part of the liturgy that we have. I mean, the invocation, I think, would be the clearest, oldest part. That's right in Scripture. But this is, this is the oldest part that we have recorded back in the 200s AD. Right? This has is, this is consistently been a part of, of the service, the sacraments, and of the church's regular, um, regular life. That's true, though. Older than the... Well, uh, sorry, uh, third and fourth centuries. Not from, the, not from the things that are in the Bible, oh. that are like straight up, um, like the the invocation, uh, Lord's Prayer, the words of Christ, fair enough. But as far as the words of the liturgy, apart from, here's what Christ said. 
I was misunderstanding. Yeah. Sorry about so, that. So, so words formed by scripture and from scripture in a sense, but not not necessarily laid out as part of the regular service of God to the people. Yeah. Uh, so here we have another instance of the salutation. We had this right before the collect of the day. The Lord be with you and also with you or, and, and with thy spirit. And here we have the pastor blessing the people. The Lord be with you, which which not only says, oh, I hope I hope that the Lord is with you. But no, I'm calling upon the Lord be with these people. So again, English doesn't do this very well, but it's a third person command. So commanding the, the Lord to be with you people here and then likewise the people blessing the pasture and also with you right and it's a plural so here in this context i will say y'all for the lord be with y'all and you and you and you uh, as far as lift up your hearts augustine um fourth century uh church father writes daily throughout the whole world uh, throughout, uh, throughout the whole world the, the whole human race with almost one voice, responds that it lifts up its heart unto the Lord. All right, so we have, again, um, St. Augustine from the 4th century commenting on, on the place of this. And then let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Um, this, this, this parallels how um, one of the names for the Lord's Supper is the Eucharist. Have you all heard that term before? The Catholics use this as their primary term, or at least they used to, for the Lord's Supper. Any idea... Why? Any idea what, what eucharizo in the Greek means or what it might reference? Especially given that I just went through part one and part two of this introduction, this preface, and now we're at part three. So fancy Greek term. Uh, uh, to give thanks. Why would we have giving thanks as part of this meal? There's a couple of reasons. To pray Certainly. Yeah. How do the words of institution begin? Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took prayer, and when he had yeah. given thanks. We also see at the feeding of the 5,000, and I believe the 4,000 as well, that the Lord took what he was provided and, and, he, and he gave thanks to God. And then he distributed it. He actually distributed it through his apostles. So Jesus didn't walk around and have every, have, hand everything out, but he did it through his pastors to be. And he, so he distributed this bread from heaven, this holy meal, uh, and it was an asterisk on that because it was it wasn't Lord's Supper. But it, we can look back and say, oh wow, that's pretty cool. Um, that's kind of how things work before before the resurrection, before Christ institutes before Christ institutes the Lord's Supper. Um, but Jesus gives thanks for these meal and he feeds the people. We also give thanks um, to God for this meal of thanksgiving, which we're about to receive. Not only do we repeat Jesus' words, including of thanksgiving, but we also give thanks ourselves in this preface, this introductory part to the, to the service, the sacrament. I think that also emphasizes that it's from God. It's not something that we are doing for him or any like an act of us. An act of obedience. Or an act of us expressing anything like our own heart. It's not us expressing our faith or something like that. It's yeah. really, but it's us receiving from God. And right. And thinking of maybe other churches that would teach differently that, you know, like um, I had a friend say to me, well, I don't understand close communion. Who are you to say whether I'm a Christian or not? And that's not what it's about. Again, it's that we're receiving from God. Yes. Right. And we want you to receive communion rightly. We're afraid that you don't understand it rightly, and you could potentially be eating and drinking judgment on yourself. Um, but if your church body believes this particular doctrine rightly, and you do and you do likewise, you should commune there for your good. Yeah. Just again, recognize it's not anything from us again. We're receiving the gift of God that we're receiving. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it is the Lord's Supper as well. Welcome to the table of not Micah Bauer, but the Lord. Yeah. And I'm called to steward the sacrament. 
that is not simply to hand it out to whoever wants it, but to give it to those who are prepared and will receive it for their good and whom it's appropriate for me to be communing. Um, if I'm not your pastor, um, so if we wanted if we wanted to make a different line for who should commune at our, at our altar, the most basic line would be um, people who are in the closest fellowship with us, that is to say, members of Mount Calvary. That would be one line that we could potentially draw. I'm not saying that we should, but that would be a line that we can then reason out what what should the line be. So if I'm if you're if you're a visitor at a congregation, um, the pastor doesn't know you. Uh, I'm charged not not simply to distribute the Lord's Supper to whoever comes up, but to administer it to people for their good. What do I need to know about you in order to give you the Lord's Supper without burdening my own conscience that I'm condemning you? What do I need to know about you? What's that? Your confession. Your confession. What, you what you believe. And so let, let's dig into that even more narrowly. What do I need to know about, about your beliefs in order to give you the Lord's Supper without burdening my own conscience or maybe misusing my office? You have right doctrine. Believe it's Christ's body. Yeah, and especially believing that it's Christ's body and blood. Right. That's part of when Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, 32, I think, says um, we must discern the body. If anyone if anyone eats and drinks without discerning the body, he eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why that's why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. Right? I'm not I'm not making this stuff up. I, I don't this is what Paul said. Right, I, I was continuing the quote, but I but I don't have like a quote voice. If I had a certain quote voice, maybe I could get away with it, but or like using air quotes. Yeah. I was thinking of this recently that that you are administering to those under your care as their shepherd. Yes. Jesse mentioned that Wentworth sends um, postcards to say, like so and so commuted mm -hmm. our church today back to their church to like make that connection of like. Your sheep was under my shepherding this week. Right. And I want you as their shepherd to know. I was like, that's wise. You know, I mean, it makes yeah. sense. Just to I mean, has it, haven't churches used to do that all the time? They don't yeah. do that anymore. Like if you if you sign a communion card and tell them your church, you don't. don't. There's a church in Mankato that does. And there's a church in Minnesota, Doug and Lucille's son's church that they go to. They call. The pastor calls Sunday afternoon or Monday morning and says, oh. someone's always here. I mean, we don't we don't go to other churches very often, but we always fill out the card. We just assume mm -hmm. that, you know, the church will the church will be notified that yeah, we weren't skipping church that day. We were actually in Spearfish, and uh, right, we, so, oh. it's really hit or miss, and we don't send those ourselves. We 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 send letters uh, to 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 individuals who are like new to the area or something. We contact them, um, but we don't we haven't been in the practice of of sending those letters to their home congregations. It's a good and faithful practice. It's not one that we've inherited. So I, I think you know the head elder, if you wanted to bring that one up. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll mention it to him. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't always listen to me, but just, you know. Fair enough. Yeah. But I said, we get that. <laughs> I suspect that on a Sunday morning when a visitor comes, you are content knowing that they are a member of a sister member's race in church. That is kind of the shortcut. It's not ideal, but it is kind of the shortcut. So ideally, when I'm out greeting folks, you know, before they come into the sanctuary, all all um, young people often don't know that they should tell someone else their name. But um, and so all I, I will end up um, saying, hey, I'm Pastor Bauer. Um, and they'll say whatever. And students especially are used to answering, oh, yeah, I'm from such and such town, whatever. And, I'll, and then, then I'll try to follow up with where do you go to church? Um, and then just as a shortcut, that's not the ideal. Um, ideally, they would write down their information and I would get and I would go visit them within the, within the next few weeks. That would be the ideal. Um, depending on on what they say. So if, if they go to a non Lutheran church or one that um, or one that I, if, if they go to a church that I that I can reasonably believe is LCMS and they appear to be a repentant person. Repentance is another part of what I, of what I need to know about them. Um, we'll we'll stick a stick a note in that for right now. Um, 
but if, if it appears that they can that they should probably be welcome here, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, and then I'll follow up. What kind of questions do you ask the visitors before they will come in? It depends on on a number of things. Part of which is, um, will I have time to talk with them before? Like, will they will they come in during the the opening hymn? Or can I actually talk with them there? Or is it going to be just at the rail? If I get to talk with them and if I have time, the, the best that I can do is um, is to ask those questions and then and then to say, you know, we're, we're, we're celebrating the Lord's Supper. We actually do this every Sunday here at Mount Calvary. Um, so if you would like to commune, there's a couple of questions I'd like to ask you. First, what is it that you expect to receive up there from the altar? What, what is it that we're going to that we're going to be administering up there? And I'll and I'm looking for um, Christ's body and blood. If they say bread and wine, I'll try to kind of encourage them to to continue on. Like I'm not I'm not trying to be harsh with this, but I want to hear a, a good confession from you. Um, Christ's body and blood. Well, why, why would why would you want that? Um, well, for the for the forgiveness of my sins, right? And if I can hear those things, and if everything else looks good, then I think that I'm preparing them to receive it worthily there, right? And this is something that we could do with members. It just takes more time, and it's not the current practice. But to again consider, oh, it's a regular Sunday, yes. Oh, I'm going to receive the Lord's Supper again, yes. Let me let me think through again what what this means. Let me let me make sure that I'm well prepared. And to be well to be well prepared um, is to uh, again for First Corinthians chapter eleven, let a person examine himself, and so eat of the bread and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Um, so examining yourself with regard to especially repentance and faith. So am I living in sin? Am I comfortable with my sin? Um, am I am I planning to go back out right after this and continue sin? Does that does that does my sin no longer bother me? If so, that's incredibly dangerous. Um, and depending on kind of where you're at with that. Um, if you're living an unrepentant life, you should not be communing. Now, don't hear me saying if you're sinning, you should not be communing. But if you intend to sin, if you, um, for example, if your plan for your relationship is that you would um, not be married at this time, but but pretend that you are, and even uh, move in together and and have sex regularly, and and be completely fine with this, and wake up every morning and say. Oh yeah, God says this is wrong, but I don't care. God's word says this, but God's word doesn't matter. That's called unrepentance, right? This is why we enforce the minor ban for that and other particular sins, right? Because you're saying what God's word says does not matter. God does not matter. That's that's eating and drinking judgment on yourself if you eat and drink that way. You're not looking for forgiveness, and Christ won't give it. <laughs> Right. This is that is why many of you are weak and ill, and some of you have died. To quote Paul again. Right. He's serious about this, and we don't have these warnings about baptism, which is why we give the which, which is why we're not as discerning about whom to baptize. Now we, we we still want to to ideally know and trust that parents intend intend to raise their kids in the church. Um, we'll try to push them to that. But if push comes to shove, we're not we won't necessarily withhold that sacrament because the Lord doesn't give the same warnings. But he does call me to be a steward of the mysteries of God, First Corinthians two or three. That is not simply a vending machine, but one who administers stewards. Um, as I explained stewardship uh, the other week, one who uh, takes God's gifts and point them to where they can do the most good. And they don't do good for unrepentant sinners. That would be a lie. Likewise, for me to comfort with the gospel, um, oh, it's okay, Jesus forgives you, without condemning law, well, that would also be the watchman who sees the enemy coming and doesn't say anything. And the Lord condemns that watchman. Right? It, it, the, the person's blood will be on my hands. Right? I, that's how the Lord traces it in Ezekiel. So this isn't some mean thing. It's part of it. Part of it is selfish. Like, I don't want to be judged for, for your sins. Um, but that's not the main part of it. But, but, but try to think. Um, 
if for those who are offended by 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 the practice of closed communion, try to think about it from my perspective with what I with what I and we believe is true. Um, I'm trying to do this for your good. I want you to be well prepared. I would love you to commune here, but you're not ready for it yet. You're not well prepared yet. You don't belong here yet. You're not in full fellowship yet. We would love for you to be, but I'm recognizing a divide which currently exists between us. And I'm saying that that divide also applies as a boundary here with regard to communion. And I'm not making this up. I'm passing on the tradition which has been passed down to us. As I mentioned earlier, for, for those who are catechum catechumens, those who are still learning the Christian faith, they used to be locked out of the sanctuary rather than even be present during the Lord's Supper. This has been the church's historic practice. What makes it somewhat new in our day is that there are so many different denominations now. It used to be kind of, are you Christian or not? And then do you live east or west of a certain line? You know, are you part of the Eastern Church or the Western Church? Um, and even then, they didn't exclude each other from communion necessarily. It wasn't like that. They had some bad blood, um, especially after Constantinople fell and Rome didn't help. Um, they were mad at each other for a long time, still kind of are. And they and the way they talk about the Christian faith is different. Eastern Orthodoxy just sounds a lot different than than Western Christianity when you talk to them. Um, but the church has has kind of figured out where that line is over the years, and, and so do we. You wouldn't go to a Catholic church and expect a commune. At least you shouldn't. And people are generally okay with that. It's just that when a Protestant church does it, then they get offended. But then if but but sometimes then if we explain, I, I believe that I believe that I'm receiving Christ's body and blood for the forgiveness for the forgiveness of my sins. Do you believe that? Well, no, I don't. Then if we don't believe the same thing about what's going on up here, why should you be offended? But I mean Satan works, you know. Yes. I tell a reformed person what we believe, they don't want communion with us anymore, but it doesn't work with the ELCA, because at least the catechized members, especially the older members, they do believe what we believe about the Lord the Son. So how do we explain that? The old ALC with whom we used to be in fellowship, um, but then formed into what is now the ELCA, and believe that they're Lutheran, um, believe that um, from their perspective, it should be fine. But they also believe that, that they're also in, commun in community fellowship with the Methodists and other groups. So for those, for, for Christians who believe that everyone should be welcome, it's offensive when anyone says, no, no, there are, there are boundaries here. Whether it's us or whoever it is, whatever boundaries someone sets are going to be offensive. For someone who already believes that there are boundaries, it's not offensive when someone else believes that there are boundaries. What's offensive is, is when they say there are no boundaries. No, no, come up seriously. When I when I was in Ghana for three months, I was there with a Methodist group, and I wouldn't commune with them, and that offended them, especially as as a as a as a white visitor to this church. I I wouldn't commune with them. That was hugely offensive to them. Because they want they want to they want to believe that the church is all together and here are these foreigners coming in to support us. And I do support you in certain ways, but not in others. And that was very offensive to them. I'd have some conversations. Now those Methodists in Ghana probably understand. <laughs> they maybe don't want to be Methodists anymore. Yeah. There's a division between the African right. Methodists. Like, yep. So, so kind of addressing Eli's question now, is it fair to say to current ELCA members who grew up in the, I mean, I'm one of those people. I grew up in an ALC congregation and it was only, it's only been in the last few years that I really realized why I so easily moved into the Missouri Synod without realizing, mm -hmm. you know, why I felt this was a good fit. Because I right. believed the same things all along. It's everything I was taught, but they are the ones that changed. Yes. And so is it fair to say that we can't communion because you are in fellowship with a church body that doesn't believe what we believe in? Yes. Yeah. And I would go to 1 Corinthians 10 for this. Um, so 1 Corinthians 11 is where you think of for the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 10 is also about the Lord's Supper. And um, well, let's, I'll just read it here. 
So this is about, um, can Christians eat meat that has been sacrificed to demons? Is that something that Christians can do? Are yes. They, yes. Are they physically able? Yeah. Right. Would it be a preferred thing to do? Not really. Well, like if you have a, if you have a, a good choice between idle meat and not idle meat, I mean, go go for the good stuff. Yeah. Um, but it, but if you if you're in the marketplace and the discounted meat is all discounted because it's already been paid for by being offered to an idol, and now they're just trying to make an extra profit profit off of it, and so they get they charge less than usual meat or whatever. Well, it, it's okay to eat that meat. It is. Paul says so. Like again, I'm not making this up. But as part of, as part of this conversation, there, there were Christians who would not only eat the meat after the fact, but they also thought it was okay for them to go to the ceremony and to kind of help to offer that sacrifice to the demon. Paul says this. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, that is the Christians, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? So again, here you have bread and body, cup, wine, and blood. So it's called both, which is why we say that it's both. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. You have fellowship again with those who commune. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices, and these are sacrifices to demons. This is uh, following um, Paul's critique of, of, of the Israelites coming through, and they, and they, and they sacrifice to false gods. For example, with, um, with, with, with the um, golden calf. So consider the people of Israel are not those who eat the, the pagan sacrifices, participants in the altar. What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the, ta and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Um, and where is... Um, well, that's more of the context. In here, I'm looking... Uh, just, sorry, just one second. Um, so in this as well, the Christians, the Christians were Christian. It's just that they thought that it was okay to also be in full fellowship with pagans, with unbelievers. And Paul says, no, even if you, even if you know that idol meat is nothing, that, that, that demons have no power over Christ, even if you believe the right stuff, you still can't commune there. And also commune here. Expressing that you, an outlet onlooker would see you doing that. Like they believe it's something. It's not only about the onlooker though. So he he goes on to talk about the onlooker and how if and on how if you're eating if you're eating idle meat after the fact, um, that's fine. But if but if a Christian uh, who grew up pagan and who associates this meat, saying, "Oh, you're worshiping demons," that's fine as a Christian. Great. No, no, no. For their sake, don't eat it. Right? So if you're alone, that's fine. Go ahead and eat it. But if anyone asks you about it, put it down and be done with it. For their sake. Even though you're free to eat it, don't burden their conscience. Don't lead them astray. But here, before, before those verses, so verse 25 would be, in, uh, verses 23 and following have that part. Here, it's you simply cannot participate. You cannot commune, we might say, at two different altars that believe different things. Even if you believe the right stuff, you still cannot be participants there. You can't commune with demons and with the Lord. That is not allowed. You're becoming united with them. You can't also be united with us. You must choose. So if you use this passage in agreement with you, but 
for the sake of argument, if you use this passage as a defense for closed communion, you tend to offend other Christians who just don't have the same practice or doctrine, but they're still Christian. Yeah. So they think, oh, you're calling them not Christian, right. or worse, even pagan. Right. So it, it is an extrapolation of of because the church in our time is not is not in the same condition as the church in Paul's day, in that there are different types of Christians who can be wrong about some stuff but still be Christian. Back then they were all in fellowship and had the apostles teaching them directly. I would say in the case of like really especially with the ELCA, you can find Christians within that church, but yes. it's yeah. literally see Satan at work in the church body acts the yep. and and so and so what I do when I'm talking to folks from the ELCA in particular is to try to show them how their church body has left has left them behind and how it is a different church and that you can't be part of the true church and a false church right and so and, and so I'll, I'll, I'll give examples such as in 20 this, I think the summer of 2020 or 2021 I was watching the ELCA um, convention on YouTube and they and they and they accepted into their into their into their constitution or bylaws I can't remember which um, they, they they removed the language which was Jesus is the only way to, to salvation. They removed that language, and so they're universalists now. And, and and when I explain these kinds of things with people who are from the ELCA, oftentimes they're shocked. Oh, I had no idea. Um, or or this or this teaching hasn't kind of gotten down to my to my congregation yet. You know, we're still Christians. I get it. I get it. You, your church body used to be good. We used to be be in fellowship with you, but it's left you behind. Conservative small congregations in the rural Midwest, your church body has left you behind. I'm so sorry for you. But they still publicly confess the confession of the larger church body, which is why they yep. are not able to. Right. And I'm guessing that you always say, but you may come up and I will bless you. As, you as well as, I, I would love for you to commune here. Can we, can we talk through these differences um, I, I, I will tell you at the outset that if you if if we receive you into fellowship, you you can't commune with your with your parents and stuff, and that that's that's kind of a big deal for you. And I get that, but can I teach you and can we talk about this and and see what you believe, knowing kind of if you make the decision to get confirmed, what that what that will mean for Christmas and stuff, because usually it's students that I'm talking with. Here's an example: we had two summers ago, we had. Our Baptist friends, who was a pastor in Monson, and they were on sabbatical. Tom and Richard were up here at my house, and they went up. They were across the church. Yeah. Conversations like that. And they came up to communion, and that gave them a blessing. And they did, like, they see the moment they did the blessing. And then they didn't make a scene, and then we had lunch together afterward, and they were very, like, calm about it, but very hurt yep. that they weren't welcome to receive communion. And I, we had this conversation, and it came down to receiving communion. It's a public confession of the mm -hmm. change, showing that we are in unity, and while we are in unity about a lot of or not thinking about what's happening at that rate. Right. And I believe also that they would be able to understand mm. and accept that, that having this public profession being like Baptist, they don't have a public confession. They don't think about their worship mm. as a confession of their faith. Yep. It's worship. We all worship the same God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so that piece of saying, like, it, this is showing what we will be showing, they couldn't understand that component. Yep. Yeah, because they don't do that. It's not what they're just about. Right. They don't have that confession. So for another Lutheran, for someone in the DLCA, they're still probably saying the class was free, maybe. Like they are used to saying creeds and saying out loud their faith because the faith whereas other Christian denominations who work with most of them here at DLJ don't have that right. question. So they didn't even have a concept on which to make 
what we do in worship is also one of our faith. It is our confession. Mm -hmm. Sacrament specifically is our confession. They would just like, could not. I thought that that was going to be like, oh, we get it. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. They did it's not, insane. they did not get it. They did not understand. It. They did not feel better about it. Yeah. yeah. This is the same thing. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I and and, and it, it does matter you're talking to, which part of close communion you are going to emphasize for them to understand. Yeah. When it comes to the Lord's Supper being a, being a, a public confession of faith, I would go back to 1 Corinthians 10, which I read from, and say that you can't, you can't, you can't commune at different altars because the confession of faith there, as well as your own confession of faith, matters. And there are places where it's appropriate and, and inappropriate for you to commune. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm saying it's Yeah. It's also because because it because it's not just a confession of faith. It's also Christ's body and blood, and they yeah. don't believe that part of it. They, they don't believe that it can hurt them. But what are the questions you ask somebody when they're visiting? That's the first thing you're looking for, and then it's the confession of the faith and the community that you're. And it's both of those things together. It's not just one place. Adam. You're a green bay congressman. You're not going to have that in the mother church at this point. Even when you see people, you have to be a fan of the church. You don't want that public confession. You don't want any other It's the same thing. Men. <laughs> no, thanks. There are some women who are passionate about sports. My sister's one of them. She went she went to um, University of Alabama because of the football football team. Boy, those are rabbit fans. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And that that was during the, the decades of Saban. Like it was oh, well, then she's just fun forever. Yeah. <laughs> she 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 got there in two thousand three. So it was already ridiculously good and it just kept going. Saban. Nick Saban, Who's coach. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, I, for my own conscience, I, I would still like to kind of talk with them and get and get a sense of whether they should or shouldn't commune um, while while I have them. Otherwise, when they get to the I mean, otherwise when they get to the rail, I would just go based on what based off of what they do. And I would follow up after the fact. Um, that I, I go with a shortcut of: Are you are you a member? Are you a member of a Lutheran Church Missouri Synod congregation? You ask that at, at the rail. Yeah, it's it's not the it's not the best way to go about it, but given just that the how things go. It seems to be workable, and then you follow up with them. So when we go visiting, and I know that we've gotten way off track, so we might as well just keep getting off track. Mm -hmm. But when we go and visit another church, you know, the process Steve and I have always followed is, well, a couple of times we've had one, either send a letter or send them with us, you sure. know, the old-fashioned way of yep. carrying, carrying your permission slip with you. Yep. Um, but we always introduce ourselves, you know, we're, we, 
we're aware of the issues and so we always introduce ourselves to the pastor but we've never had a pastor ask us any questions other than mm. you know say where we are and we're members at Mount Calvary and Brookings and yeah. you know they just assume then that we're Missouri Synod but we've never had a pastor ask us are we Missouri Synod if we haven't brought the letter we've never had a pastor ask mm. us you know the questions that you ask yeah um, I think in a couple of instances they just knew by connection that we were able to be like you know in churches where we're just absolutely unknown that I don't think that's the standard practice. Right. So what would you suggest? For whom? For you? For, for a visitor, like a member yeah. of your congregation. So here, all of us. If we travel to another congregation, especially where the pastor doesn't know us. Um, first, I, I want to make sure I, I, I say something so that, so that I don't forget to get to it within, within this hour. Um, it's not only about what church body you belong to. It's not only about that. It's not only about your, your confession of faith. It's also about your confession of sins, that is your repentance, um, which is, we kind of touched on this earlier of, if you choose to live in sin and you're not bothered by it, you should not commune lest you eat and drink judgment on yourself, right? And so um, this is one that it, that it's difficult, if not impossible for me to gauge without knowing you for a while or without having, you know, some level of spiritual conversation, um, which Often, in order for someone to open up to me, there needs to be a level of trust built over some amount of time. Um, so that that's one that it, it's hard to discern that ahead of time, which is why I had kind of have to give the benefit of the doubt. Even if you think about the first Sunday I was here as a pastor, I was I was administering the Lord's Supper. I, I did two baptisms, Adrian and uh, Kenton Baker, and I was administering the Lord's Supper. I didn't know y'all. Right. But I didn't have, you know, an hours long conversation with each of you. I kind of gave you the benefit of the doubt and then follow up later sort of thing. To be fair to you, Pastor, the Lord knows your situation. Right. He knows the heart of the of the person that you're working with. And so, you know, the, the I don't know if anybody knows the passage from Ezekiel, but where it says, you know, the judgment will be yours if you mm -hmm. do not. If you don't warn them. Yeah, don't warn them. So, you know, kind of like you told us today, just do the right thing, let the mm -hmm. Lord take care of it. Don't worry about you know, what you say. The words aren't going to change anybody's mind. Your actions aren't going to change anybody. It's, 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 it's not entirely off the hook, but right. right. Yeah. From my from my perspective, be faithful, do what you can. Right. Here are the principles to have going into it. From your perspective, um, I as a pastor, when I when I look out and and see visitors, I I keep a bit of an eye on them to see if they know what's going on, and if they if if they appear to be Lutheran. By the fact of, for instance, if you make the sign of the cross and you're a visitor and you make it correctly, like, well, if you make it, if you make it the Lutheran way of up, down, right, then left. So in the same way that I do this towards you, for you, it's right, then left. Um, then I, I kind of know that that you you know what's going on. And likewise, if you're if you're at the rail and you're looking at me kind of expectantly and desi like desiring the sacrament sort of a thing, um, that helps me to know that, yes, you know what's going on here. Um, it, it's not it's not the full answer. It's not the full answer. Um, but it helps to reassure me that yes, I can give this to you in good conscience and then follow up. I've been making the sign of the cross wrong this whole time. I go left to right. So you're Catholic. No. Oh, no. <laughs> it makes it's very, my, very my, little difference. My... Makes oh. very, very little, very, very little difference. Okay. But That's technically the way Lutherans do it. Is, is the way that I do it to you, right, then left. The idea is that your heart's on the right side of your chest. I don't. That doesn't really matter. It's just the way that we do it. Part of it, I think, is just to kind of show Catholics that we're going we're gonna to keep the history but also be different from you because Catholics do it left and right. I don't know. It makes very, very little difference. But if you, but if you do it the Lutheran way, I notice. Especially if you're a visitor and I see you doing it. Oh, okay, they're, they're almost certainly Missouri Synod. Yeah. The answer to this the question you have to remember Lutheran churches and sin. The congregation is only a member of sin because the congregation desires membership in the sin and believes what the sin is. Mm -hmm. Purpose one of the primary purposes of being in sin is that we walk together in our faith so that when we do open church to church. 
we already know by the fact that we're the long term church that belongs to Muslims that we believe. That is one of the purposes of having a larger church body and not just the individual congregation. Is that when you have some of this is short up to the question of like, are you a member of the Boston Church? Mm -hmm. The reason why it you know, work is a question is because there is an assumption that that pastor is taking the same ordination about that we have, is teaching the truth of the gospel just as we are. And so by membership, you're going to be the same thing we are. It's not perfect. But that's the purpose of being part of Synod. There's other reasons, but that for the laity, that's one of the big reasons to be in a church as a person. And that's why leaving Synod would exempt all of those members of that congregation from communion and all Synod's churches because we're no longer publicly saying anything that's Very good. Um, is remarkable how. For, for as much infighting as the LCMS has sometimes, it's not about doctrine. It's not about teaching. Like we all we all believe the same thing within a very narrow band. Um, pastors, so so um, parishioners are, are held to the Bible and the small catechism. When you make your confirmation vows, it's about the Bible and the small catechism. Um, for ordination and uh, for ordination vows, it's, it's a whole book of Concord, which includes the small catechism as well as the large catechism, the Augsburg, uh, Augsburg Confession and his Apology, uh, Treatise on the Power and Primacy of the Pope, Small Claude Articles, and the Formula of Concord. So pastors agree even more, we, we, we understand and agree even more narrowly, and we, and we preach, teach, preach, teach, and confess according to that even narrower standard. And so um, when, when you go from one congregation to another, it's, it, it should look and sound very similar not only because we have a catechism, because even the even the ELCA has the catechism, but because we have like the formula of Concord, uh, because 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 we teach, preach, and confess even more narrowly within our doctrine, uh, consistently than than others do. Right. 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 Yeah, we don't we don't have uniformity in practice as a requirement <clears throat> uh, for things. So within Christian freedom, you can eat idol meat. Within Christian freedom, you can do contemporary worship, which isn't to equate those two things. Um <laughs> You, you you can have different practices like that and still be a faithful Christian. Um, we believe that it's it's not as if none of that matters. There's kind of a matter of of good, better, best sort of thing to it. Um, but kind of give some charity if you go if you go and visit a, an, an LCMS church when you're on vacation or something, and it's not the kind of LCMS that you like. It's fine. It's fine. Go to church, receive the Lord's Supper, as long as there's faithful preaching there, um, and rejoice that you go to Mount Calvary. Question on that. Yes. If we attend a church, an LCMS church in another town that has open communion. Mm. Um another LCMS church that, that practices open communion. Uh. Oh look at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I confess I went to church in Sioux Falls about a year ago and I took communion at a church that offered everybody in the sanctuary. Yeah. It's it's certainly not the best practice. Um, if you're coming, you you should you should at least consider not commuting. I don't know that I can give you a definite yes or no on it. Um, especially if it's if it's the kind of thing where, um, like you haven't had the Lord's Supper in a year, and you're just starving for it. I'll give you grace on that for sure. Um, it, it's tough to give a, a streak yes or no. Um, Right. You don't know the words that the pastor says. Oh, he like made a statement of like everybody was in I see. Mm. If if he's if he's stating that publicly, really consider not communing. But if it if if it's just kind of like if it's like in the bulletin. Um. So if, so for instance, um. Uh. There's a congregation in Florida. Um. That's 
that 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 we've been to a few times that they their their questions in the bulletin are much more general and not the kinds of questions I wish they asked. And they could lead to functional open communion. Um, I tend to let them slide on that and, and, and commune when I go there, when we go there. Uh, but it does make us uncomfortable. And it should. Yes. Yeah, you are a worthy recipient. They, it, it might be, it's and so it's a matter of whether or not it's appropriate for you to commune there, sort of a thing, rather than, okay. <laughs> okay. Very good. And that's called repentance. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. One brief announcement. Next week, students are coming back. Greet them. Like, be happy that they're here. They're like one, one of the benefits that we have over just campus ministries is that we have a full-fledged congregation that wants them to be part of our family. So do that, if you would, please. Thank you.